We're hearing the word diversity quite a bit during this conference. And our next speaker wants to encourage you to really think about how inclusive that term is when you use it. She's director of VSA and accessibility at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. She oversees national and international disability arts and education programs, including VSA, the VSA Network of Cultural Organizations Engaging in Arts Education and Disability, and the Leadership Exchange in Arts and Disability Network of Cultural Arts Administrators. Please join us in welcoming a SphinxCon founding partner, Betty Siegel. Good morning. So what are we afraid of? Afraid of the unknown? Of the fearful other? Are we afraid that disability is catching? Do we fear becoming disabled ourselves? That seeing someone with a disability makes us feel vulnerable. That we might say or do something stupid when confronted with disability. We were told to work art into our uh, program, so that was music. Just to keep checklists going, okay? Now I have to go to my next slide. The people who answered this best are the Teaching Tolerance Project of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and they sum it up by saying, there is a form of prejudice in our society that surrounds disability. It is a discomfort, a subtle fear of that which is different and unfamiliar. It manifests as pity, avoidance, or mockery. And when we see someone with a profound disability, a fleeting thought occurs to us. What if that were me? Drama. OK, dance and music and drama so far. OK, so people tend to avoid those who make them uncomfortable or guilty. They don't know how to act or how to respond to someone so different from themselves. It can be really scary. What do I do? Do I shake his hand? Do I pat him on the head? Uh, if I help him, will I break him? Will I hurt him? Will they fall? So let's talk about disability. I have to do it in the context of history. And so you'll excuse me if for just a little while I sound a little bit like your high school teacher. All right? So context. First off, there are almost 57 million Americans with disabilities out there. 57 million. One in seven working adults will have a disability. One, two, three, four, five, six, you. One, two, three, four, five, six, you. Sometime during their working life. There are different models of disability that have been developed. So these are important for us to understand because I think that these are some of the reasons why we fear disability is this trajectory of these social models. So the first one is the moral model. In the moral model, disability is a punishment. Punishing the person with a disability or a member of their family for a sin by a vengeful God usually. The disability can cause the family to be stigmatized and even ostracized from their community. The next model is the charity model. In this model, people with disabilities are seen as victims of circumstance, tragic figures deserving of pity, and thus they're perceived as needing care, not capable of looking after themselves or managing their own affairs, and presumed not to be able to contribute to our society. The next model is what we call the medical model. This model views disability as a problem. And the problem resides in the individual with the disability. They have a physical or mental limitation that needs to be fixed. Like people can be broken. We think they need to be fixed. And it is the medical establishment that has the power to do that fixing. And thus the doctor is the decision maker. The one, the one who knows best. The individual with the disability is passive, dependent, unable to make decisions on their own. Well, clearly, the disability community rejects those three models, but we carry them with us because they are the process through which society perceives disability. So the disability community says, heck, we want to be in the social, civil, human rights model. This model represents a huge 
cultural shift in our perceptions and attitudes about disability. This model, people with disabilities are presumed to have equal rights, to be active and independent, to be contributing members of society. And importantly, in this model, it is not the person who needs to be fixed. It is society and the environment. Interestingly, in 2001, the World Health Organization redefined dis disability as a contextual variable. Okay, so those of you that are really academic, I don't even know what that means. But it talks about the fact that a person is more or less disabled contingent on the environment, whether it's the physical environment, the communication environment, information environment, et cetera. You know, so for example, if there are no stairs anywhere in this world, is a person who uses a wheelchair actually disabled? Think about it. Another recent development that I'm very excited about was in 2006, the United Nations passed the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. It was the only convention in the history of the United Nations to have the number of signatories sign onto it at the beginning of the convention. Now, just interestingly enough, I want you to know the United States has not signed on to this. Call your senators. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to be political. So, um, call your senators. <laughs> We'd like this to pass, okay? But the really interesting thing to me about the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities is Article 30. Article 30 guarantees that at the international level, people with disabilities have the right. It's not a privilege, it's not a charity, it is the right to participate on an equal basis in cultural life. And then all of you know about the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act, the Civil Rights Act for people with disabilities. 25 years ago, it'll be 2015 will be its 25th anniversary. I thought when it was passed that I would have a job for a short time because after all, it prohibits discrimination, right? And all it takes is a law being passed for discrimination to just go away. I'm still here, and I still have a job, unfortunately. So let's jump ahead to today. Um, actually, just to last week, a friend of mine sent me um, an interview that was online and suggested I check it out. It was an interview that appeared in the Theater Communication Guild's Diversity and Inclusion Blog Salon. It's a great interview about working with disability-specific theaters and about working with actors with disabilities. But what I reacted to in this blog, and the real reason why my friend sent it to me, because they like to see my face turn red and see me blow up, was a gentleman named Tim who responded to the interview with the following. Now, I've edited it slightly for brevity. If you wanted to see the whole thing, you can go online. But I'll read this to you. I would love to include performers with disabilities in my productions. However, at the most basic level, I doubt that I would get the fullness of performance out of an actor who cannot see me or his castmates or the set. Actors act with their whole bodies and all of their senses. I'm not saying it wouldn't work, but I think it would be a hell of a lot harder to work with an actor who is confined to a wheelchair than an able-bodied actor in a wheelchair. I'd be putting extra pressure and responsibility on everyone else, and I'm just not sure that's fair. I would never dismiss an actor for having a disability, but I don't see myself lowering my standards for quality of talent any time soon. Okay, he went on. I'm thinking of an actor, Bob, who might use a wheelchair at times. If I cast Bob in a role that does not specify a wheelchair-bound character, my story doesn't make sense anymore, unless we address it. I'm not saying it wouldn't work. I'm saying it's really a difficult problem logistically and artistically. I'm glad this discussion is happening, but I would like to point out that not casting folks with disabilities is not a direct result of a bias or just being a big jerk. It's a more complicated issue. So I wanted to share my response with you, but first I just want you to think, if you haven't already, about what this means when you substitute the words person of color 
or woman, women for the terms disability and wheelchair user. So my response, and I'll read it to you. No one is asking you to lower your standards, certainly not the disability community, but we would like you to address your ignorance. Let's take this opportunity to be deliberate, intentional, and thoughtful about human diversity and the value that it brings to the arts. Your response that any actor with a disability is an onerous burden on you and others in your company, and that they are less capable and less talented, are two of the perspectives frequently found amongst people who lack experience and who fear the unknown other. It comes from being unfamiliar with the diversity and range of abilities to be found in people with disabilities. I suggest you look around you. One in five individuals in the United States is a person with a disab disability. Statistically, you're already working with someone with a disability. It's just that they don't conform to your preconceived and onerous notion and stereotype. Yes, this is a complicated issue, just as complicated as in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and possibly today, when the same excuses you used were justified to not hire people of color and women. Thank goodness, thank goodness, some members of the theatrical and cultural community, I suspect many of you sitting here, thank goodness they were not deterred and took on these tough and complex issues, giving the arts social relevance, deeper artistic impact, and meaning. Working with and integrating actors and performers with disabilities is no less nor no more complex than those other deep and difficult questions still being debated and discussed around casting and diversity today. I am heartened, however, because when I look around today, I see that there are more examples of institutions featuring the work of performers with disabilities and more directors casting actors with disabilities. I see more actors with disabilities pursuing careers. I see more actors being cast as the character with a disability and more actors being cast as the character as a person. I see disability being portrayed as life on our stages in TV and film. And a few examples are up here on the screen. Switched at Birth with Katie LeClerc, who's deaf. Private Practice with Michael Patrick Thornton, who's a quadriplegic. Glee with Lauren Potter, who Down has Down syndrome. Cirque du Soleil has a performer named Durgan Tuckmack, who has polio. The Kennedy Center has long featured amazing artists with disabilities in such venues as the Millennium Stage. Search the archives for the performances. I, try, I can't play them for you today. They're too long and they're too wonderful to give you just a snippet. And look for Homer Avila, Justin Coughlin, Adrian Antoine, who I hope you'll hear later today, Blue Eyed Soul Dance Company, Lisa Buffuno, Lisa Thorson, Blessing Offer, Lynn Manning, Peter Cook, Mario Hernandez, don't let anyone ever tell you that we do not have enough amazing performers with disabilities. So, what can we do? Well, I think I'm very proud of the Kennedy Center for putting artists with disabilities on our stage on a regular basis, basis as part of our commitment to our community. I'm also really proud, and I need to let you know, and so, this is not a secret. Next week, my office will be releasing eight RFPs. We are putting $1.5 million out to the community in order for you guys to execute arts and education programs for students K through 12 with disabilities in music, theater, and the visual arts. Look for them next week. They should be posted by Friday on the Kennedy Center website. We still have a long way to go. It takes thoughtfulness and it takes intentionality. And re realistically, I believe, that it takes us in the theater and in the arts to show the world that our, what our community actually looks like. I have one minute, so I'm going to tell you this quick story. I believe in changing the world, in case you couldn't tell. Eliminating the fear around disability is not going to happen overnight. And valuing the contributions, contributions of artists with disabilities for their perspective is something that we have to nurture. And that means we're going to have to get comfortable with change. We have to change our attitudes and perspectives, and we have to change the attitudes and perspectives of the people that we work with. But I believe in change. What was not possible before becomes possible now, so I leave you with this picture. 
Star Trek. So this is a story I heard, I don't know if it's true, but there was this guy who, back when Star Trek was first being shown on television, wrote a letter to the um, directors, and he said to them, how did you do it? How did you make the doors open by themselves? Because you all remember what happens, you know, on every Star Trek episode, Kirk and Spock are sitting on the bridge, and all of a sudden, <laughs> the intercom thingy comes on, and it's um, Scotty. Captain, Captain, I do a terrible Scottish accent. The warp core, it's about to explode. And so Spock and Kirk, they jump up and they run to the back of the bridge and they don't touch anything, right? And the elevator doors open, right? And they run on and the elevator doors close behind them. They haven't touched anything. Self-actuating doors. Well, this guy wanted to know how they did that. And the designers and the directors of Star Trek, they're like, oh, well, uh, okay. So they write him back a letter and they say, well, you know, we have these two guys named Joe and Fred. And when they run over towards the elevator, they go, whoosh, 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 and open and close the doors so that Spock and Kirk can run through. So the point here is that in 1969, that's when this first showed, we were landing on the moon. And we did not have self-actuating doors, but today, we do. Think about every day you walk to the grocery store. What's there? Think about your everyday life. Self-actuating doors. And so what this story means to me is that change can happen. It only took 40 years. But the same is true of accessibility and inclusion of people with disabilities in the arts. What is inconceivable for some today, like my friend Tim, can change tomorrow with our help in changing awareness, perceptions, and attitudes about disability. Thank you. Before we bring on our next speaker, we wanted to mention that there are some comment cards um, on each table. And if you can fill those out and share your thoughts about the convening thus far, it will help Sphinx. Uh, better shape the convening for the next year, get some feedback from you, that would be very useful. If you follow the news, you've likely come across the term food desert. These are communities that don't have access to affordable or quality fresh food. But there are also communities that are arts and culture deserts. Our next speaker believes arts and culture can be used to engage and empower those communities. He's the program director for the National Guild for Community Arts Education based in New York City. Prior to joining the Guild in 2012, he worked as an artist and arts educator in New York. He has over a decade of experience in youth development, arts education, and community engagement. Please welcome a Sphinx Con founding partner, James C. Horton. So I have to share this quick story with you. As I walked around the hotel yesterday, you know, I noticed oh, this is an interesting group of folks. We got, we got the Nation of Islam here for Savior's Day. We have a tattoo convention happening. And then we have these little girls here who are performing. And for one second, I honestly thought about getting diversity tattooed right here. Just, just so that I can keep focused on what we're doing today. That's, that's, I'm just joking. I, I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to do it. Um, when I think about diversity and what it represents to me, it has given me the opportunity to achieve and succeed in this country. It has laid the foundation for my parents, my grandparents, to go to college, to become PhDs, to become everything that they can be to move me ahead and my family. And then I had to remind myself, at some point, I represented that diversity, be it an organization that I joined, a profession that I had, a group that I was a part of. But what does diversity mean in the context of social development and arts enrichment in the community? Like many of you here, I live this work. It has become a part of me, shaping my perception of the world just as much as my eyes and my hands. But let's talk about developing communities. Let's talk a little bit about Star Trek. Betty just mentioned that, by the way. 
let's have a different conversation about diversity. 11 years ago, when I started my career as a teaching artist, um, working in Central Harlem, God, that was long ago. I walked into a classroom with about 30 boys and girls who are all very eager to learn what I was bringing to the table. I was encouraged by my director at the time to be very experimental in, in my curriculum development. Use my imagination, just, just go for it. The program was in the heart of Harlem. And while I was green with my cache of acting techniques, I was eager to develop the next Madam C.J. Walker, Zora Neale Hurston, Paul Robeson, all those greats from the Harlem Renaissance. And the students looked at me, what is this dude doing? Does he know who we are? Does he know who, what, what, what we really want? And I thought they'd just be excited to get up and move and, and do some theater. My students weren't interested in my learned skills. They weren't buying what I was selling. So I began to realize that the participants in this program who I was working with, according to the U.S. Report on Poverty, 11.7%, 32.9 million people live below the poverty threshold. It's in 2001. 2012, 46.5 million people lived in poverty. You see where this is going, right? It's not going anywhere good. 43.3% of Central Harlem residents receive a form of income support from the government. That's today. Life skills and career readiness for this population of young people I was working with look more like the ability to dodge bullets and block fists than it did to learn a character's internal monologue to learn job readiness skills, to learn how to interview for a job. See, if, if I wanted to connect with this community of young people, the group of youth who had already established ownership over the program, I was in their space during their time talking about something that I hadn't made relevant. Therefore, it was irrelevant and it wasn't important. So one day, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm in class early before my students get there, and I hear this guy come in, he's, he's bum. Like, what's going on with him? And then another group of students, the girls got around him like, oh, something must have happened. So he's sitting there and he's telling this story about an interaction he had with the police. And all the other students, they stopped. They took off their bags, they're sitting there and they're listening to him. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. He got their attention. And in that moment, it, it was my aha moment, it clicked. His story had to become my lesson plan from there on out. This is about inclusion, including the young people in this process of self-discovery, of self-exploration, and moving forward in this creative movement. From then on, I took these young people to go see speakers and practitioners from the community who are able to relay their stories. There is a way out. That way out doesn't necessarily have to be through sports. It doesn't have to be through a microphone being on stage, being an MC. You can do it being a performance artist. We brought speakers in. We went to exposures, the Guggenheim, artist openings, gallery openings, about inclusion. There is a place for you here. You don't have to be that person who plays the back. You belong. And then we reflected on what was happening. So the students are now thinking about, huh, I might be able to do this, but I hadn't built that confidence up in them yet. And they hadn't gotten that confidence in themselves. So here I was, a black man, working in Harlem with students of color in our community, and I was the outsider. It's, it's, it's really interesting to me, the places that you find separation, it's just, just so unexpected. And I had to connect this to, to what we were doing. See, diversity is not a destination or an end goal, it's a journey. 
And as artists and arts educators and administrators, it has to be intentional. Listen, the USS Enterprise could not have boldly gone where no man has gone before without Spock, Ahura, Sulu, and Captain Kirk. By 2009, I had the opportunity to direct my own program, very similar to the one I started off in, in my beloved Harlem, but Harlem had changed drastically. Gentrification, we see it happening all over these urban communities, in Detroit especially. I was charged with recruiting over 400 young people for a program that had previously served 70 youth putting together a single stop service program, social service program, recruiting for an adults learning community and implementing a wellness project to help with the obesity problem in this urban environment. All this had to be done within a year's time. And I looked around and I said, there's no way in hell that we as a staff are gonna be able to do this by ourselves. We have to get out and do this. This is not something that's gonna happen being driven by us. This is a community effort. So we got out, we went to churches, community board meetings. Um, gosh, we partnered with schools, parents, 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 and more parents. The more parents that we can get involved, the better this was. We talked to gardeners in vacant lots. We talked to small business owners. And through collaborating with that community of partners who had a similar vision of uplifting and building that community, we were able to get the job done. <clears throat> Parents and police were happy because kids were off the streets. Small business owners had youth who were able to intern with them. We had vacant lots, community urban gardeners who were able to have young people come and work in their lots to help them grow vegetables. Students were going to school, performing better. We found that the teachers, they, they got excited. Through our adult learning program, we were able to get grandma and grandpa to do online bill pay. And yeah, we got them on Facebook too so they can connect with their grandkids and their kids. This was a collaborative effort to transform this community into a sustainable resource. And never once did we mention the D word. We did it by bringing people together with different experiences, different stories, and expertise to address a common issue. The National Guild for Community Arts Education serves 435 plus multidisciplinary organizations. At the Guild, we're designing strategies to create equitable access to arts education and building a culture of continuous improvement in our member organizations and the communities they serve. Now we truly know that there are high level benefits when you are inclusive collaborative in nature, and accessible to everyone. This idea of collective impact is something that we at the Guild really, it's, it, it just makes sense. It's bringing people together from different sectors to work toward a common goal, to fix a complex social problem. Would you say that this issue of diversity and inclusion is a complex social problem. This doesn't work. Would you say that this issue is a complex and social, social problem? Yes. yes, thank you, appreciate that. Well, I have a proposal. This is Sydney. That's my daughter's name, but that's not my daughter. What if, what if, on Sydney's 10th birthday, there was a meeting organized by her parents or her school guidance counselor or maybe her arts program. The parents were there, of course. We had her teachers. We had her coach. We had her doctors. And we had the arts instructor, the crazy art lady. What if they all got together? And maybe it's 10 minutes, maybe it's five and maybe it's a virtual meeting, and they just talked about Sydney and what she needed to be successful. Now this model already exists when you look at social service programs, but that doesn't happen until it's too late or until there's a problem. This also exists in the name of an intervention. 
What if we led with this play, which is all inclusive? And again, Sydney's learning how to be diverse. She's learning what inclusion looks like through what we're doing. Last month, I was out in LA for a meeting that we had, and I had the opportunity to visit the Watts Arts Center. And I met with their director, Rosie Lee Hooks. She is fiery. Woo! Love Rosie. And Rosie's showing me around the campus, and, and we're walking around. She's talking to me about the programs that they have and all the different people they're working with. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, wow, Rosie, Rosie, do you know what you're doing here? This is collective impact. This is collaborative effort. And Rosie looked at me, and she said, oh, yeah, this is, this is, this is the way we work. This is the only way that will work. Which, another aha moment. Of course it is, Rosie, because this, this is what makes sense, to bring everybody on board in your community to make the community better. Again, the idea of collective impact working toward diversity. What does this model look like? So usually, through the idea of collective impact, there's five conditions that need to exist for it to be considered as such. A common agenda. So what are we working towards? Mutually reinforcing activities. So they don't have to be the same, but they have to complement each other to work toward that common agenda. A shared measurement system. What if we were able to quantify diversity, and not in terms of I have this many people of African-American um, descent on my staff, I have this many Latinos, but what if we could actually say, if I get this group of people over here to work with me, I can do this. If I get this group of people over here, I can do this. So that shared measurement system, we're looking at data now to drive how we're gonna develop this program. Continuous communication, it has to happen in order for it to work. And then a backbone organization, who are we going to build this type of program, this collective impact structure around. That scaffolding is very important, those layers. Through working with the National Guild, I've had the opportunity to see hundreds of programs in action. And some of those programs are doing amazing jobs at this um, collective impact work. We have the um, Wild Music Institute at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Big Thought in Dallas, Texas, doing an amazing job um, with, with this collective impact model. And the city of Philadelphia's mural arts program. All of these programs, again, that common goal, taking bits and pieces of things that are working in the community in different sectors and working towards such. Actually, the National Guild, let's see, probably about a year ago, we released more than the sum of its parts and in this, um, this publication by Tom Wolf and Gigi Anthony of Big Thought, we addressed um, this, this collaborative effort and sustainability. It is time that we move beyond technicolor boundaries of diversity and embrace an expanded, innovative version, vision. Excuse me. It's, it's, it's not a black-white issue. It is an all-encompassing, all-inclusive, how do we move, build, and develop together as a community? The arts depend on it, we depend on it. It is our unified goal and mission to do as such. Thank you so much. We have time for a couple of uh, follow-up questions and I wanted to ask you, as you're building these, these coalitions across sectors, what are some key ways you identify allies in those sectors or create allies? Absolutely, absolutely. So one thing that I found that's, that's quintessential is that you have to have a very clear mission. Um, you can't say, well, we're gonna try a little bit of this, we're gonna try a little bit of that. But if you're working toward, okay, we're gonna build this community, one thing we wanna address is violence. So who are you gonna collaborate with in, in addressing violence in the community? It may be school officials, it may be the police department, and that's, that's your partnership over there. If you wanna address a wellness project in terms of community health, then you're talking to urban gardeners. You may even partner with a local grocery store. I remember we did one collaboration with um, Whole Foods, and it, it was amazing. The kids are talking about, I'm eating healthy, and we had a culinary program where the kids are 
They're making quinoa and they're making kale salad. I didn't know this tasted good. It was beautiful. But um, it's being very specific in who you partner with and being able to focus those efforts accordingly. Sometimes, if you're doing this work, you may come across different sectors where there's some bad blood, and, and there has to be some bridge building or some um, repairs to yeah, those bridges. Absolutely. How do you address that? I think that's when you, you, you get into, you know, you hire people, and when you have a diverse staff and a diverse group of people, you know, I, I, I think Star Trek is the greatest analogy of something like this. Um, the Klingons don't get along with the Federation, but they have Worf. So Worf goes in and he speaks Klingon and he talks to the Klingons and is able to bridge that. So it's able to have those cells in place. I know it's a little crazy, right? But it's able to have those cells in place to address and communicate with those different sectors and those different different types of folks. I, I'm a Trekkie, I just have to say, having Star Trek in two talks this morning is just the my idea of heaven. Possible. <laughs> so you're talking about Warp Klingon. I'm like, yes, no, that makes sense. He had some problems with the Klingons too, but then he yeah, was able he to, so yeah. Um, so <laughs> uh, finally, in, mm -hmm. it's been my experience that it can be difficult to maintain momentum. You get the ball rolling, um, different people in different sectors have different agendas or their focus can shift. Yep. How do you keep everyone moving in the same direct direction and keep that momentum going? Absolutely, so that is the importance of having that backbone organization. You have to have somebody who's gonna drive this work. And it, it's not easy, it is not easy. In these programs that I talked about, they've, it, it's been years in the making that they've had to do this. But um, th that backbone organization and constant communication, even if it's just a hey, you know, just I'm alive, we're, we're doing, and that data and having benchmarking points of we're gonna have this done by this date, this done by this date, it's, it's hugely important. So I would say the backbone organization um, having benchmarks and looking at the data and then those constant lines of communication. Okay, James Horton, thank you thank very you. So now we are heading into our first networking break. We will be back in this room at 11. And we want to encourage you to use this time to talk with one another, share some ideas, things that you've learned so far this morning. There is coffee in the networking room. I, was t I know someone said hallelujah. There's Starbucks, so that should have a nice little kick if you need a little extra jump start this morning. Also, if you're on the Google community page, uh, there is a question posted there. We want you to share your thoughts, um, and those will be up on the uh, screen in the networking room. And the question is, what are two components of a diverse arts organization or community? And that question comes from Xavier Verna this morning. So again, Refreshments in the room next door, and we will meet back here at 11. Thanks. <laughs>